There we go. Um, Brigadier General Tammy Smith of the US Army Reserve uh, serves as director of the Army Reserve Human Capital. She's had a distinguished career of over 26 years. Uh, 28. Oh, my research let me down. It's the numbers. Again, it's the numbers. Um, including having served in uh, Panama, Costa Rica, and uh, more recently in Afghanistan. And the repeal of the don't ask, don't tell um, laws allowed Tammy to come out. And uh, back in 2012, she became the first openly gay flag officer in the US military. And since then has been a very vocal and public advocate for being out, not just in the military, but in general. Um, and in 2013 received the Out and Equal Advocacy Award. And it's also great that uh, Tammy is joined by her wife, uh, Tracy Hepner. And Tracy's co-founder of the Military Partners and Families Coalition, which you know, we talk about support and the support people need. And it's a fantastic organization that is the voice of support for LGBT military um, partners and families. Um, and also their first time to the Netherlands. <laughs> but unfortunately, they only get one day to enjoy it. So we'll see, we'll, hopefully you'll uh, at least enjoy uh, this little part of it. So with, uh, with that, a big welcome to uh, Brigadier General Tammy Smith. Thank you, Lord Brown, for those uh, wonderful words. I'll be, I'll be using some of your phrasing uh, in, in some later remarks that, that I give. And I'm sincerely honored to be asked to provide my personal perspective about what is my story and about where we are in the United States military in terms of LGBT rights and what is available to us as service members. Prior to September 2011, um, it wasn't legal to be a known gay or, or lesbian and serve in the United States military. I now have about 28 years of military service. I served in the US military for 25 years under that outright ban on homosexuals and then later under the policy that became known as don't ask, don't tell. I have to note that with the repeal of don't ask, don't tell, it did not provide any inclusive policy for individuals who identify as transgender. It only affected those people who are, are lesbian, gay, or bisexual. So I'd like to share a little bit about my own story, give you some context for how the repeal of this policy has impacted me and my wife, Tracy. And I'd also like to give you that update of kind of where we are in the military in terms of our progress. I entered college in 1982 and I had an Army scholarship is how I ended up being in the Army under what is our Reserve Officer Training Corps that pays your, your, pays your tuition if you agree to come into the military uh, after, after you've completed your education. I came in in 1982, but in 1981, for the very first time, the Pentagon had created a new policy where one had not existed before that said unambiguously, that being a homosexual in the military was incompatible with military service. And prior to this policy in 1981, you might have been discharged for being a homosexual if your behavior became an issue, but not simply for being perceived as a homosexual person. And the new policy back in 1981 required that upon application in our volunteer, all volunteer military, each candidate was actually asked whether or not they engaged in homosexual behavior. And an answer of yes on that form was an automatic denial of entry into our military. So one of my earliest struggles with being gay in the military was in the freshman year of when I went to college. And when that law, or when that new policy for DOD came into place, the, our Officer Training Corps in our university was now kind of out of step with university policy because our university had a non-discrimination policy. And so there was a move to um, essentially kick our ROTC department or kick our military training off of the university because of the disconnect between what was now the military policy and what our university policy was. And so the professor of military science asked me to be one of the students who wrote a letter to the faculty or to the, to the university that gave the reason why we shouldn't be kicked off of campus, 
even though we had this discriminatory policy. And so they kind of fed me what my argument was. They said, well, because you're a cadet, no one ever actually asked you to fill out that form that, that where you had to declare you were a homosexual. And so just as long as you don't let anybody know, they didn't know that I was gay when they, when they asked me to write this letter. Um, just so long as no one asks our cadets, then it should be no problem as long as they don't tell. So even back in 1982, I had my own don't ask, don't tell that I perceived that I put upon myself. But I did this for the reason that many people do when, when they come into that type of situation. It was a personal economic decision. I wanted to go to college. Everybody wants to leave their small town, right? The way you leave your small town is you get a good education. And the only way I was able to do that is to have somebody else pay that tuition. And so for that reason, I went along and wrote that letter. Uh, they, they, didn't kick the, uh, they didn't kick the ROTC off of campus, and I was able to graduate. And I, I forgive myself now when I look back on that, 1982, the world was different. Um, how we were perceived as people was different then. And again, it was an economic decision, and I, and I recognized that as I look back on that. So I didn't, I entered the Army as a second lieutenant in about 1986, and I really didn't think about the ban on homosexual service being unfair at that time. It was just kind of the way that the life, that our lives were at that time. I simply kept my personal life secret. And I had two sets of friends. Now, I never felt like James Bond. Um, <laughs> But I did become an expert at telling this parallel story for my public life that absolutely did not match at all my private life. And if I happened to see one of my gay or lesbian friends in the commissary or maybe in the motor pool, the rule was we would simply walk past each other and pretend like we didn't know each other, rather than to face a question of somebody asking, well, how do you know Lieutenant Jones? It was just better to pretend like that you didn't know each other. So I worked really, really hard to be a good soldier. And I learned my craft, I learned to lead. And the thought that I could ever be included as who I really was in our military, it, it simply it was unthinkable for me as I came into the military in the 80s. So we'll fast forward to 1993, and that was the year that um, President Clinton signed that compromise that was the don't ask, don't tell law. And that law replaced that Pentagon policy that I talked about that was the outright ban on homosexual behaviors. I was about 30 years old at the time that this occurred. And the original intent of Don't Ask, Don't Tell was to let closeted gays remain in the closet. And so the Don't Ask, Don't Tell part was that they took away that question on the admission forms that ask you, if you whether or not you were a homosexual. And so, so long as you didn't, um, tell, the, the contract was that they would not ask you. And the other part of this new policy was the don't pursue and don't harass. And with don't pursue, don't harass, uh, no longer would investigators be coming into our barracks and reading our mail and reading our diaries and um, or posing as gay in an officer's club to try and entrap somebody. So under the new policy, that type of behavior was no longer allowed in order to find people uh, who were homosexuals. And so in 1993, you know, I believe that all of this was really good. And I, now I, I reflect upon what I believed, and I just reflect sometimes upon the paradox of compromise. And then in 1993, I believe that by marginalizing myself and by putting a lock on my own closet door, by dim diminishing myself as an individual, by pretending those I loved didn't exist, and by ignoring my partner, if we were spotted by somebody in public, by uh, somebody that I knew, that somehow that my life was better. That's how we thought about don't ask, don't tell. Our life was better, even under those circumstances. But I gotta tell you that here's the deal as a military member, and I see we have a few uniforms in here today, is I totally bought into this paradox because I loved serving my country. I loved wearing this uniform, and I always think of this uniform as a symbol of what are American values. And this was better than that outright ban because now I really felt like I had a place where I could serve in this little niche as long as I didn't tell, and frankly by this time I had gotten really, really good at not telling. This uh, 
So this approach, it kind of shifted the military back to where it was prior to that 1981 policy. And I guess if you think about it as law and policy being a bit incremental, this was a forward step, even as I reflect back at how I was willing to self-marginalize myself uh, in the early 90s. Though now as a senior leader who's responsible for formulating human resources policy, I have a more clear understanding that policy development often requires compromise. But I also think about the thing about compromise is that in a compromise, somebody always gets compromised. In an inclusive culture with aware leaders, it gives policymakers the tools to understand those human implications of compromise, compromise as we develop our policies. So as the years passed, um, especially after meeting my wife Tracy, I have to say it became harder and harder to live two lives. America started to change, marriage equality becoming reality in some of our states and the increasing visibility of gay people. Corporations and local governments began to understand that if you really wanted to hire the best employees, screening out gays or lesbians was frankly a kind of a stupid approach to personnel management. And living two lives, it really became too much for me. So in late 2009, I submitted my retirement papers and I had invested 23 years at that point and it was time to leave the thing that I absolutely loved. I loved wearing a uniform, and I loved being a soldier. And Tracy could tell you that my heart was heavy when I submitted these retirement papers. But then in February of 2010, the most amazing thing happened. The Senate, our Senate had taken up the question of the possible repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And our chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mullen, he said, these very compelling world, words that li literally shifted the national debate on the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. He said that Don't Ask, Don't Tell created a conflict between personal integrity and in institutional integrity. And when he said that, I felt like he was talking to me because that's how I felt on the inside. I had such dissonance between what my personal integrity was about serving and what the institutional integrity was and how they were treating me. And so for the first time in my career, all the way from cadet to full colonel, a senior leader in my organization, an executive, for the very first time said that it was okay to be exactly who I was, that who I was was good enough to wear the uniform of the United States. And in hearing those words, I cried a little, but I also felt hope. And I felt like maybe, maybe I should stay in the Army. And so with that, I asked to withdraw my retirement papers, and uh, the retirement was taken back. And my supervisor at the time said, I really don't understand why you were retiring anyway. You, you know, you're, you're really a good soldier. And of course, even at that time, even with that hope I felt, I still couldn't tell. I just had to say, well, I made a mistake, and I would like to stay in and continue serving. And because I had withdrawn my retirement, of course, I had then remained eligible for promotion that occurred at a later time. So Admiral Mullen gave me that hope. And I would just suggest that a defining element of an inclusive organization is leadership by example. And the willingness for an ally or an LGBT person, an executive who gives other people permission to speak those inclusive words and to have that inclusive voice. I was selected for promotion just a few months after the ban was repealed. When I got the word, Tracy and I, we had to decide together and say, what, we're, how are we going to do this? Because even though the ban had been repealed a few months, I was in Afghanistan at the time the ban was repealed. And then when I came home, I was soon after selected for promotion. You know, we had to decide, what are we going to do? Are we going to be out? And I was aware that up to that point, no other flag officer in the military had come out. And so there was potential for media attention and possible ridicule or personal attacks. And it was frankly a very, very scary position for me to be in after 25 years becoming so good at being in the closet. The idea of being out was frankly a little terrifying to me. So Tracy and I, we decided together that being a general, it was too big of a job for that added mental stress uh, of hiding who we were. And there was no longer a barrier to open service, so there would be no hiding who we were. We figured that the risk was worth the potential reward. And frankly, it would have been disrespectful to Tracy 
had I taken this next step because our military puts so much pride in our families. It would have been disrespectful to Tracy had I continued to try to hide our relationship upon the promotion to general officer. So for us, there was just no alternative in a post don't ask, don't tell military. We, we had to be out. And so with that, we decided that, that she would publicly place the star on my shoulder and that we would acknowledge during that ceremony that she was, she was my partner and we were married at that time. But this is my personal bottom line on coming out is I don't think we come out to try and change anybody else. First and foremost, we come out and we, might, and we push what might be traditional limits to be authentic to ourselves. We do it to be authentic for those we love and for those who we lead. But when we do come out, what happens is that we reveal something new that shifts perceptions and replaces stereotypes. Others see us who we, for who we really are instead of who they think that we are. Because at the end of the day, everybody in the ranks, regardless of their personal views, they want the same thing. They want mission accomplishment. They want bottom line results. They want effective organizational outcomes. What was so crushing about Don't Ask, Don't Tell was just the constant, constant fear of discovery. You put so much energy into that double life and then maintaining those two sets of friends. You treated the very people that you love the most as a sinister secret instead of celebrating their love and their friendship. And I have to point out that what was a little different about Don't Ask, Don't Tell as compared to some of the lack of protections that we have in, in the United States and that we don't have an inclusive uh, set of policies that, that protect us uh, in the workplace is that under Don't Ask, Don't Tell, the law required that if you were discovered that you must be fired that regardless of how your supervisors felt or how people who you worked with thought about your, your uh, level of effort or production, the law mandated that you must be fired. And that was one of the differences under Don't Ask, Don't Tell that caused even more um, pressure to not be discovered. And the other part of this pressure, and I know I talked with a few of you about this last night, is that there's that feeling when you're wearing this uniform that if you're discovered, and you're, out and, you, and you're outed in some way, and then you are dismissed from the military involuntarily, you feel like somehow you've let the military down. You have this feeling that somehow you have failed the military because they discovered who you are. There's this weirdness that goes on that when you put on this uniform, and if you hold true to the values that you feel in this uniform, that you were put in this weird place that even as you're discovered and you move on now to a civilian life, you always have that feeling that somehow you met, let the military down in your discovery. And I'm just so thankful now that our young people and our young soldiers, our young service members will no longer have to have that feeling as they move on. And I have to share with you that despite my fear of coming out, and uh, Tracy held my hand through the whole thing, is that uh, it was overwhelmingly positive. It was good. And I realize that being a Brigadier General insulates me from having anybody, frankly, walk up to me and be mean or harass me in any way. Um, but nothing stopped people from contacting me when the public news of my promotion came out. And I have to tell you that not a single person anywhere went out of their way to send me a single expression of hate. I didn't get a single hateful email. I didn't get a letter sent to the Pentagon that expressed anything negative. I did hear positive, though. I got positive emails. I got positive letters. There were very, very positive things that I heard. And a lot of them was uh, from people I had known in my past. And their biggest thing was, oh my gosh, I didn't know you were married. <laughs> and so it, it wasn't even about that I didn't know you were gay. It's just I'm so happy that you are married. And so that was much of the positive reinforcement that I got out. So, but as an aside, since I came out in 2012, there are now three more currently serving U.S. flag officers who are out, and all were promoted by their commanding officers on military installations uh, with their spouse at their side. And so even though there was no longer a constant fear of discharge, there was no recognition. All it did was take away the fear. There was no... Um, it didn't do anything for Tracy. So we, the military at the time of repeal was unable 
to extend any of the benefits to Tracy that would typically be afforded to a military spouse because we had the other law that exists in the, in the United States, and that is the Defense of Marriage Act. So what it did from a policy perspective in the military is it created, it was good, but it also created this weird gray area where our institution didn't know what to do with the spouses of our military members. And in the military, what we want to do is we want everybody to be treated the same. And so the Pentagon and, and our policymakers actually struggled for how do you handle similarly situated couples who are now not eligible to participate in many of the good benefits that the military affords um, with, without with that other structural barrier that was in place. And, and you have to keep in mind that in the US Army alone, not even our other services, we are authorized strength. We have over 450,000 people in our Army and another 205,000 in our Army Reserve and another 356,000 in our National Guard. I mean, we're a huge organization, and we rely on the overarching policy in order to provide the guidance over that large and that distributed of an organization. And for about a year, frankly, it was, it was just confusing. People wanted to do the right things for our families, but it was just, they couldn't because the, the policy was just too unclear on that. And so when I think about that is there is good intent often as we develop our policies and as we look and go through and try and develop what is best for, for our workforce. But we, we have to always remember that our good intent has to marry up with inclusive policy that our families and our members can access, that those two have to be put together in a way. And frankly, for the military, the repeal of parts of the Defense of Marriage Act in June of last year uh, was a very, very positive thing for our military because it took away that ambiguity for our service members or for our policymakers. And so how it exists now in our US military, a married person is a married person. And regardless of the status or the orientation of that particular couple, the couple has access to the, fully to the same benefits that any other service member has. I'm, as Tracy and I think about this, she has literally gone from being illegal <laughs> to being fully included in the military organization as a spouse uh, since the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and then later as what happened with our Defense of Marriage Act. <laughs> And so what has changed significantly for us is just our ability now. I am fully integrated as part of the military now. Uh, we had the opportunity because now the policy is clear. We, for the first time in my entire career, I live on an army post and we live in military housing and we live are integrated just with our regular neighbors who three years ago I couldn't even have let them know that Tracy was a part of my life. And now we move into our house and they're bringing us fruitcakes to our door <laughs> to welcome us to the neighborhood. So I'm extremely proud of how our US military as don't ask, don't tell. I mean, we, there was great national discussion about whether or not this should be repealed at the time that we, we were leading up to it in 2011. But I'm extremely proud of our organization that once the law was repealed, that the organization truly moved forward to do its best through its policy as best as it could in that gray area period, and now with the repeal of DOMA, to create inclusive policy and to ensure that everybody who uh, has, is in a same-sex marriage is, um, is included. I know that, again, it's right now, we, we do not have policy at this time for our transgender uh, individuals. We do have transgender individuals, of course, who are serving, uh, but they are not able to serve openly, and they must, of course, present in their, in their biological gender in order to continue service. Uh, but for the rest of our, for the rest of our LGB, LGB uh, population, uh, we, have, we have moved just incredibly fast in three years, and I am extremely part, uh, proud to be a part of that. So I appreciate your time today and for the opportunity to share a little bit of my story. And I just ran off. You did. Okay. <laughs> I 
think what's wonderful in the story that you've told, as well as John, is the message to our straight allies, you know, about the power of fear and, and how important um, that coming out process is in terms of how personal it is. It's going to be different. And even in organisations or places where you hear, but we have the policies, yeah. just do it. What stops people coming out? Yeah. It, that's not good enough. It, it's that innate fear that we all have and the fact that you and John were able to overcome that and the, and the role modelling uh, that you do today, um, we're highly appreciative yeah. for. So a small token of uh, our yeah. appreciation of your visit and uh, thank, thank you, so you very much. much. Thank you.